So close, so close. Oh. Remember that analytic functions cannot use complex conjugate. Remember that was one of the first things we showed? Mm. Yeah. I like is this is this function analytic? Yeah, so for the uh for the first problem of homework eight, um, I ask you to find the zeros, right? This is homework eight. I believe so, right? Yeah. So you're supposed to find the zeros. Yep. And as you do so, you realize that you have a function that's supposed to be a function of z, which is really a function of x and y. And so I told folks to, um, let me just move this a little forward. I think I even have I think I, do. I think I might give you a question. I did. Yeah. Okay, can't yeah. Remember. I haven't given you notes on it yet, but I can do that. So. Okay. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, I did. Yeah. No, 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 no. I can, I can do it. Too. I'm working, um, I've been working on the other one. So. Okay. Yeah, so, one of the things that I recommended to people is to consider what happens to the function along the real line. So, what does this function of f of z look like it's along? Like it starts at zero, you're talking about, or if it... take, take y equals zero. Y equals zero. And look at what the function looks like. Approach from that. Okay. And you've got 90% of it. So approach from the real, then approach from that. Just, yeah, just look at the real. The real will be just enough. Just look at the real, okay. The, the, you'll get it as soon as you look at the real, because once you've guessed what it is, right? Once you've guessed that it's blank of Z, then you can use that function and see if you get back your function of X and Y. Oh. Does that make sense? I, I, <laughs> I kept setting one of them to zero. Yeah. I, I I really did that, but I didn't know where to go from there. Then uh, uh, you said like why did you Then we just left it. Let me pull this up. I then we're left with what? With the real part. Homework case. Okay. Sure. What does it look like? Yeah, it's just sine two x over um one yeah. minus what's that? No, it's a part it's partial with respect to x, right? Let's talk about it offline. <laughs> Um, it's like I said, it's four letters. Z. Z. It's tangent. What? I, I know it's tangent. Too. No. Oh, what is? So I, you'll see. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give too much away. More than I already have. Oh. Okay. Um. But but like I said, it, it. The the thing about working with um with complex numbers in this way, and you go back and you start thinking about. Okay, I have this X and this Y, and I need to put it back into a framework that looks like Z. Um, the, the important thing to do there is to see the behavior of the function, right? And then say, okay, let me just guess what the function will look like. And then you can apply the relationships that you know, right? So if you imagine you get something that says something, something X, you say, well, what if I turn that into a Z instead? Does it still behave like I know it should behave in the real and imaginary parts? Because you know what the real and imaginary parts are supposed to look like, right? So then you expand what you have, the one that you just guessed, into those again, and you see that they're consistent. You see? It's a little bit like how we used to do, and maybe you guys didn't do this in your um, uh, Math Methods 1 class, so when I was in undergrad, sometimes we would like guess a value for a derivative. Yeah, in the, in the, yeah, in, in the, yeah, that's you get like a partial, but not the partial. Yeah, 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 partial. You, you get like a vibe. You're like that feels like a sum of sines and cosines, and so you kind of just guess it, right? And then you have to figure out after the fact what the coefficients were to make uh -huh. it work. Well, the, yeah, they if they have certain formats, if there's like educated guesses that you're supposed exactly. to be used for the partial differential equations or whatever. Okay, so this is uh, May 1st. Oh. So we have this class, and then we have Monday's class, and then we have Wednesday's class, and then you're done. Oh, sh So I was gonna show you some um, ways that we use the residue theorem. I know that folks have talked to me about branch points, and you're like, well, what the fuck is a branch cut? Like, why would I ever use that? So I thought today we would do both of those things. We'll show you the power of the residue theorem. We'll show you the branch cuts. And then we have a decision. I generally don't believe you can learn anything in the last week of classes. Um, and that might just be me. 
Uh, maybe, you know, because I'm sort of stressed out for finals, since there's no final for this class, maybe you're not as stressed. Um, more stress. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's the worst opposite, but okay. okay. That's fine. I mean, if that's the case. So generally what I would say here is um, there is a section that we never got to, which would be group theory. Oh, yeah. So if you want, we could do like a week of just intro to group theory. And group theory is a mathematical formalism that sort of describes, um, like, it, it, applications include stuff like um, standard model of uh, physics. So, for example, how do we describe the relationship between electrons and the other leptons? How do we describe the relationship between protons and the other hadrons? So, this is something that turns out to be very valuable when you think about particle physics. There is some really beautiful symmetries associated with group theory. I don't think we'll get as far as that in, in two days of understanding group theory, but you get an, an introduction to understanding that. So that would be one idea. The other would be applications of complex numbers. So I know some people like Sarah, who's online, um, have not been able to take fluid dynamics. And Emilio, I don't think you did fluid dynamics either. So I feel like that would potentially um, not be as helpful to other people, but there are conformal mappings and solutions to the Stokes equation that are only um, describable in the in the context of complex planes. Um, similarly, if you've taken ENM2, um, which I think many of you have, maybe not all of them, just maybe the same two who took fluids, um, you can use them for complex potentials. Um, so the, the, the value of complex numbers is quite broad and there's a lot of, um, uh, places that we could use them, but maybe that's not something you're particularly interested in. If you want a new flavor versus if you want something that, you know, you've seen already in a little bit more detail, we could also potentially talk about Hilbert spaces, which are the tensor spaces necessary to understand general relativity. So you just like turn on the general relativity hats. But what I would say, how I would, how I would caption all three of those choices is that there would be no homework on those. So I'm a little slow in giving you a homework here because I want to see how well you respond to using the residue theorem. And then the next homework would be on the residue theorem and branch cuts. And then the final one would be just sort of uh, summing up some work that you've done over the course of the semester. But it wouldn't be on the new topic. Okay, so you can raise your hand multiple times. Raise your hand if you would like to see applications of the complex analysis. Okay. Raise your hand if you'd like to see group theory. Okay. Raise your hand if you'd like to see Hilbert spaces. I didn't sell that one very good. <laughs> okay, so it looks like most people, and I, Sarah, you can let me know online uh, afterwards, or you can Slack me what your preference is. Um, looks like people are leaning towards group theory. That's almost unanimous. And technically, that's in the little paragraph that I'm like legally supposed to teach you, so I guess if I give you one week, then no one will yell at me. <laughs> Did you all submit your SOTYs? Yes. The only one that matters. Sarah, did you finish your study? No, I haven't even started. Oh, oh, okay, oh, you're oh, online he, right now. You can do it. He, 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 okay. He. So what was um what was Couchy's integral to him? It was the integral over a closed group for an analytic function of B uh -huh. is equal to zero. Good. Yeah, exactly right. So there's some contour integral of f of z dz, and we said that that was zero. And the caveat here, of course, was that f of z was analytic. And Isabel rightly got very upset um, and said, what the fuck, bro? Uh, that first integral you did was 2 pi i. And so then we found out that if it's not analytic anywhere in the domain, so specifically at a singularity, we do not call a function analytic at that point, right? The function would be analytic everywhere else, but it's not analytic at that point, right? So instead, we had to modify this. How did we modify this? What's that? The residue. What'd you say? The residue of a, a, sub a sub one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're talking about the residue theorem now. So we say that we add a contribution for all poles intruded in the region C 
plus the sum of the residues therein. Okay? We can talk about how to calculate the residues if you care. Let me make this official J. Okay. So where are J? Are all residues enclosed? Z exclusive setting is analytic except at N. Okay. So this is the modified catch up. Yeah. And this is the one that's actually more widely used, of course because generally speaking, we always end up with holes and they're really annoying. Okay, um, you may have noticed that I said sum of residues. And you're like, wait, we just showed one, right? So that's like a tricky thing that I did. Is that right? No, it's not tricky. Okay, so let's imagine, here's a world. Here's one pole, here's another pole. And this is my favorite part about this type of complex analysis. Who needs math? I'm just going to draw pictures, and you're going to believe the picture, okay? So here's my contour, okay? At some contour C. Now, I have the freedom to draw it however I want, don't I? Yeah. So let's shrink it down, okay? And there's a new contour. <laughs> it is cheating, but this is the best part of complex analysis, right? Is that you can draw your contours however you'd like. And in fact, we will take advantage of the cheating component of contour analysis in order to do two really fun integrals today. Um, Typically, I would never say an integral is fun. And typically, I would never ask you to do an integral because Wolfram can do it very quickly. But there's a lot of power in understanding how we apply this to get integrals done. Okay? So let me draw this so we have some room. Um, <clears throat> we're going to add some more stipulations when, when we uh, think about some of the ways we do integrals. But let me just start with... Uh, uh, let's start with the first one here. Um, suppose you have an integral of a form zero to two pi of some function f, which is a function of cosines and sines. Okay. How can we how can we take advantage of this functional form? to use complex analysis. What about this tells us that it's inappropriate? Oh, the, the cosines and exact data that we're getting pressed in a really different way. There it is, right? So we see this deep connection between Euler's method and complex analysis, right? So if I see a function and I want, you know, you're, you're given this task to evaluate this integral and you're saying to yourself, well, I'd love to evaluate that integral, but let me take advantage of the fact that I know there's this relationship between complex analysis or complex numbers, I, sh I should say, and um, sinusoidal terms. So I can do this by writing <laughs> cosines and sines. How do I write cosine in terms of um, Z? Yeah. So let me first write what Z is. Z is? No. Oh, it's more than Oh, is that, is it like modulus exponent pi theta? What's that? Modulus exponent sine uh, i theta? Correct. Good, right?
And in this particular circumstance, we don't even need to do that. Let me just write it like this. So, why do you do that better? Is there a particular reason? Okay. Like, I know some books write it like that to so we'll write E's or whatever. Sure. Yeah, so this one is just saying that since we're talking about sines and cosines, and they have a modulus of one, one so the R gets dropped. Okay. It's a little lazy, but for the purposes of what we're going to do, it's going to clarify a little um, that, That'll just make it easier to think about how we do cosine theta here. Right. We're constraining it to the given circle, by the way. So cosine theta would be? Z plus Z negative one to the power of negative one? Yeah. Almost right? Almost. Seen that before? Yeah. Hey, what about sinus? It should be one over two I times Z minus Z minus. One over two I? Yeah, but I don't like I with number. Is that okay? Yeah. I just prefer it, right? Because that'll make me easier. Z. Z what? Cool. And what's D theta? Didn't be Z over X on that is? Uh, you're close. I'm gonna go with minus I over Z. Well, you have to, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, because yeah, you, you want, you got to get this by itself, yeah. and then you have to take the DC. Mm -hmm. Right? That makes sense. Okay. Okay, now I'm going to add one more theorem up here. This one is really fun, and it's going to allow us to do fun integrals. So what's cosine of n theta? Say that again. Would you have to multiply all the times e to the n? Not quite e to the n, but very close. It's just to the n. Right? All the z's go to the n. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we just do one half z to the n plus z to the minus. Cool. Okay. Uh, that, by the way, is called de Mauvres theorem. It's from a different section of the book. I don't think I pronounced that right, but it's a French person, I assume. Um, okay, so now you have all the tools. Okay, so now let's look at the power of complex analysis. I see some sinusoidal function that's evaluated from zero to two pi. It doesn't really matter what it is. I can use this. You know, you won't always need this piece here, but you can definitely use this to solve that integral. So let me give you an interval. Okay. Here's the integral. I from zero to two pi of cosine two theta all over a squared plus b squared minus two a b cos theta b theta where a is 
greater than zero and less than B. Plus. Okay. What's the answer? Just a question around what is the first thing you're doing? I'm wearing all the what's on the computer. Okay, good. So you're taking theta and you're turning it into Z, right? Yeah. Okay, good. I was going to do the double one again. You won't need a double. Okay. Yeah, okay. You want to take advantage of the fact that we're going to work in the complex space. Take the integral. So just give us the power. What do you mean the power? Yeah. Did you use this one here? Yeah, right? okay, okay. Yeah. All right, what do we got? Okay, first question, where does the integral go from? Oh, yeah. 
Sorry. <laughs> okay. You need to one point. You need to buy yeah. two points. Right. And what happens when you go around the inner circle? Oh, uh, one point. Right. So. Um, this is an integral over. Hold on, hold on. No, no, this is not. It's not a cop out. Remember that you move from a one-dimensional integral to where? No. Oh, to to the to the unit circle, right? Let's have a look. Okay, this is x in the iy. Okay, you started here at zero. Okay, and then you went all the way around the unit circle, and you come back here. So what kind of integral is this? Ah, it's a contour. So the first thing we have to remind ourselves is that we don't have integration bounds. We have a shape. Oh, okay. Right? And the shape really matters. So here's my contour C. Because all we learned in the past couple of sections is the importance of finding the contour and therein finding what? Exactly. Right? We got a closed loop. So what are we asking? Is it analytic? Well, yeah, we're gonna find out if it's analytic after we find it. But then assume that it's analytic, assume that I didn't give some fucked up answer. What do you want to find? Oh, What's the value of the integral? Nope. No, it's two, it's two by i times the residue. Residues. Some of residues. So what are we gonna look for? Oh, uh, just the residues. You have to look for the residues. Before that, you have to find the Poles. Okay. If there are poles, then the integral is non zero. If there are not poles, then the integral is. You see? So this is the plan we're setting out. Okay, then we can do all of the stuff that you're doing already. Let me see what kind of Z's and whatnots you have. If there, if there are so one over then it's non-zero. If there are, if there are poles, then the integral is non-zero. Okay. Right. So each pole contributes a residue. Yeah. I don't know how you see that already. What's the denominator of like? We just want to be really careful here. So in fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump ahead. Hopefully you work this out on your own. Top's got an eye. Okay, what's the bottom guy? Yeah, you know, see why I have a side. On the bottom, I'm gonna have three turns. On the top, I'm gonna have one. Or sorry, two. Why do I like that form? I don't choose that form. Well, think about how we start. Z to the two yeah. plus Z to the minus two. Yeah. So now I can take out top and bottom so that I just have Z to the four plus Z. Or sorry, plus one. Right? Isn't yeah. it the case? Yeah. Isn't it the case that if I can see the negative two? Yeah. Can I do this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm using myself now. <laughs> there we go. Sure. Right. Uh, well, that's that's multiplying by one. And then I just apply this in here, make that one, make this four. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. So now this that one comes sense. out. Okay. Where does this live? Oh, okay. okay. And I'll let you do the other two. Yeah, yeah I was getting, okay, now that a z squared on the bottom makes sense. Like, wait a second. Okay, so we got a z squared on the bottom. What else do we have?
What does this look like? Yes or no? Should we give it to you? A minus B squared. First one's going to be Z minus A over B. Second one's going to be Z minus B over A. All times B. Factor out. Yeah, because I factored out the ABs. In order to do this, I got the A from here and the B from here. Or sorry, the B from here and the A from here. Right? And the Z's, I can work them out. Okay, so now before we can jump in to asking about poles and whatnot to try and solve the integral, what's the first thing we have to ask ourselves? Well, we can like find the poles. But... Yeah, the little hidden step. <clears throat> What do I need to know about GZ? Doesn't that have to be analytic? That has to be analytic and not blow up at the location where your pole is. Is this analytic everywhere? Yes. Yes, by definition, right? Yes. At worst, it can be zero. Yeah. Right? Okay. Good. All right. So that's the first, you know, hidden step before we look for our poles. Now, where are my poles? When it equals C naught. Correct. And where does it equal? Where are the poles? Maybe we have B equal to zero at the bottom. Oh, yeah. We set that equal to zero. No, no, no. You can just look by inspection. Yeah. So we have we each have... term since they're multiplied. There are how many poles? Three. Three. Right. How many? Are inside my, my circle. Oh, with B3. Oh, then oh, all three poles are very close. Fine. Uh, very close. Oh, wait. Let's do the easy one. Oh, well, yeah, there's, a, there's one at zero. Good. There's one at zero. What's the order of the whole? Second order. Good. You see that? Yeah. Okay. Now what? Mm -hmm. Are there any other poles? Or are we done? Yeah, A over B. A over B is a pole yeah. that lives inside of C because A is less than B. Oh, okay. So when Z is equal to A over B, then this is a pole. Now, clearly, this is also a pole, but it's a pole that lives outside of the unit circle one. Mm. Right? Okay. Okay. So I'm not going to spend infinite time on this. Um, you can do this in one of two ways. You can find the residual by expanding into a Lorentz series. Um, and then you find out that uh, you get the, the following answer. You can prove this at home if you'd like. 2 pi a quantity squared over e squared times b squared minus a squared. Cool, right? <laughs> this is like a type of integration where you don't do the integral. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? All right, so let's do another one. Um, let's do an infinite integral. So this one, we saw this really natural um, correlation between the Z and sinusoidal functions or repeating functions. So the exponential and the sinusoid, of course, have this deep relationship. But now let's look at some infinite integrals and we'll see if we can take advantage of complex analysis to give us our answer here. Can I get rid of this? Yeah. Okay. Mm. 
So we have to make some statements first about um, some infinite interval. So let's consider first um, the following interval. And before you freak out, before you freak out, that's okay that I did this, right? Have you heard of this before? Real numbers? Yeah. Okay. So I want to evaluate some function, a real function, from minus infinity to infinity. Okay. So if f of z has the following properties. Um, in the upper half plane, the imaginary part of zero is greater than equal. Imaginary part of z is greater than equal to zero, except. For finite number of poles, oops, none of which lie on X. So for we're going to see that this is kind of wishy washy when we do a second example. <laughs> so I'm going to put that in quotations. Okay, that's the first one. Okay, so what did I just say there? Let's draw our circle. Can I get rid of this two plus two? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I have in my mind some function, okay, f of x, and all I've done here is I've projected it into um, the space called uh, the imaginary space, right? R. Okay, so the is Right? Okay. And let us imagine that this is some distance R. And this is some distance minus r. Okay. The integral that I would be considering here would be from minus infinity to infinity. Right? So therefore, the integration goes like that. Correct? Yeah. How do I close the contour? Where? Do I need to go back? Yeah. Good. And that's that first statement. F of Z is analytic in the top half. Good. Except for a countable number of poles. And a stipulation that none of them exist on the real line. So if there are poles, they're only up here. They're not here. I don't care about anything below that. That's the first rule. Okay. Okay, the second rule, which uses this picture that I've drawn very nicely. <clears throat> On a semicircle, a radius r, there, r times the maximum of your function tends to zero as r goes to infinity. So if Um, here's z times f of z goes to zero and z goes to infinity. What do I mean by that? It means I can't be integrating a function that doesn't disappear as I go away. Okay, so most of the value of the function f of z 
needs to be contained in the part here. If it diverges, then this trick will not work. Do you see why that is? Do you see where I'm about to head with this? Yeah, the, the function that I want to, so I'm, I'm pulling a trick. I'm pulling a fast one. I'm going to teach you how to do an integral of an infinite plane for some functions of f of x using complex analysis. And I'm doing that by setting up some very specific rules. And as long as those rules are true, we can do this fun trick. So it's not generally applicable. So for example, if f of x is a sinusoid, right, you would use that other trick. Because that, in fact, does not go to, that does not go to zero at infinity. Right? Still very finite value. <laughs> okay. So we need something that disappears. Because what I'm going to do is you, the integral that you care about, minus infinity, infinity, is related to this integral that I'm about to create, which is a contour integral around this half circle. Right? You see the similarity? I got to let r go to infinity. So if r as it goes to infinity, the f of z doesn't disappear, then the integral doesn't exist. Okay. okay, finally, you have to say something like this. Um, and this one's just important. You have to say that the integral from minus infinity to zero of f of x dx and Integral zero to infinity of f of x dx exists. <laughs> That's necessary. Okay. Okay. Why do they break it up into two? Uh, just because you could have a you could have a full. Okay, um, so if that's true, then what can I use? Can you say anything? I was gonna say the complex analysis sort of just like being able to convert like, I, oh, maybe, maybe the imaginary part of that part too? Not the imaginary part, but the, this is the real part. Real part. Yeah. Right? Say that again. Yeah, so here, here's what here's what we're gonna say. We're gonna say that this is going to be equal to two pi i times sum of residuals hmm. uh, above or let's say how do I want to write this? Sum of residuals is Imaginary part of Z. So in the top half. Okay. Anyone believe me? <laughs> I want to see it. <laughs> Prove it, you bastard. Okay. So let's do the first one. Here's the integral. I'm going to do it a little tricky here. We're going from zero to infinity. Okay. We do dx. Okay. So A is real, it's a real constant. Um, I want to take this integral. Either some haven't been invented yet, so I can't just plug this in both of them. Okay. So let's see if this works. The analytic with y greater than zero is just the fact that there's no y. So what I mean by that is, um, is this function f of z, 
is this function analytic in the region of space such that, right? So another way of saying it is like, I think we're all the same. Like, if you have f of x, x, but there's uh, f of g, we all know where y is. Yeah, I think, but well, y is always true. But in the ones that we have x, we know. Through the function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the function of x, correct? And all the rules are with f of c. I know, but imagine, how would you go from this, f of x, to f of c? Oh, using a pressure modulation. You don't even have to do that. Keep it going. Yeah. So if you think about this, right, z equals x plus i y. So this one here, right, you would just write as um, the. Z minus i y. Well, we're looking at a, a form that is functionally the same, right? If you go from a function z to the real part, It'll look like this, right? If it has this form. So, for example, let's think about the let's think about the function of one over z. How does one over z behave only on the real line? Right. Say that again. Yeah. As one over x. Oh, you just said you said okay, x equals z, y equals zero. Exactly right. So along the real line, we have this correlation. Right? So if my function here depends on x, then I can just look at it and I can say, okay, this thing well-behaved analytic along the real line, right? If I extend it and I ask the same question of z, right? You can, you can probe these questions. Does that make sense? Is that too much of a loop? No, 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 no. It's the real part. Maybe it's the imaginary. Well, we are. You're approaching it from the real. So, so you, you start by thinking about it just on the real, right? All of the functions that you've known in your life up until this point have been real functions. Oh. But they just exist as a subset of all functions, mm -hmm. real and complex, right? So this relationship here, right? You say, okay, if I imagine the function was an f of z that has this form z squared plus a squared, right? Does that tell me anything about my function, which is just on the real? You see? So you just replace the x with z then. What's that? You just replace the x with z. Yeah, so just imagine this function. So now, how would I write the function f of z? Uh, Good. Does that have any poles? Oh, it does have a pole, doesn't it? Yeah. When z equals a, is that correct? Uh, when, uh, oh, with the, uh, I, what negative I is? Negative I. Or just I. Yeah, would be, yeah. What fun? I, I, I. All right. It's okay. both. Oh. Oh, yeah, it's going to be plus or minus. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Right? So where are they? Uh, yeah, where are they? Wait, well, hey. above the line. Oh shit, they're not on the real line. Okay. Yeah, one is above one. Oh, they're they're yeah. Let's see. Yeah, it's just there. at a yeah. <laughs> but the x component. Oh, the oh, oh shit. The real component would be zero, right? <laughs> Oh, wait, wait, wait. Up, and down. up and down. Yeah. Because yeah. the i is on it. Yeah. There's one up there and then one below the real. I don't know. Where do I put it, guys? Someone's yeah. got it. It's on the i y line, right? Ah, it's on the i y line. Okay, so where is it? 
Um, at A, up, A, A, A down. Ah, good. <laughs> and then, yeah. Good. So that one looks like a flower. Is that okay? Yeah. Good. Well, yeah. All right. So now we have a poll inside of our region. So let's ask these questions again. Okay. Is F of Z analytic in this region? Correct. And do I have a thing for that? Yeah. Except for how many how many polls? Finite. Finite. Is that is it countable? Two, three, five. Yeah. I can count two. I'm dumb, but I can do it. Okay. Do they live on X? No. no. So we're chilling, right? Okay. Second one. Does F of Z times Z go to zero as Z goes to infinity? F of Z times Z times Z. You read it, I don't know. Yeah. Z times F of Z. Yeah. No, nope, incorrect. Two Z. Infinity over infinity? The One the bottom infinity is bigger. Ah, okay, this is an important statement for me. The bottom infinity is bigger, right? Yeah. So one over infinity is what we're thinking. Yeah. yeah. Because as this thing gets very large, it really looks like Z over Z to the fourth, which is, of course, one over Z to the third. Yeah. Good. It's very different than infinity over infinity. Mm -hmm. Okay, final one. Well, you don't know those dates. Okay. <laughs> um, so how would I do this? Okay. Okay, that's fine. Um, so for higher order polls, finding residuals can actually be very annoying. What's the order of this poll? Four. Four. Yeah, so it's like fucking. Ugh. Okay, so uh, let's uh, expand Z. So we can say Z is going to be something like uh, AI plus some small amount. You love that symbol, right? That's everyone's favorite symbol. What is that symbol? Oh, um, the little like Xi. That's a sock. Oh, Xi. Xi. Xi, yes. You have to like swallow that first concept. Okay, um, so you can expand this in order to obtain the residual, um, and uh, this basically gives you this really fun part. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, and we're looking for the residual for uh, a Lorentz series that is centered around this new variable psi. Okay, and we just want the minus one. So the coefficient is given by this. We'll see. <laughs> when, when you go to when you go to do Lorentz series, so we never did Lorentz series in detail, but there's just a formula for writing off the Lorentz series. Okay. And so all you're doing is you're just grabbing the a minus one coefficient here for the Lorentz series that um, writes this. Okay. This isn't like witchcraft that I'm doing. I'm literally just reading off uh, the definition of a one, right? Okay, and this thing just happens to be uh, minus five pi over 32a to the seven. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 the Laurent series. 
Oh, uh, Lorenz. Lorenz, yeah. Yeah. So um, the Lorenz transformations, which we've also done in this semester, um, those convert from one system to another. The Lorenz series is a form of the Taylor series that allows us to use um, powers of our the expanded negative. variable yeah. in the negative yeah. one over that number to some power. They're both converted. Yeah. Well, so the, the thing that is different, of course, about the Lorenz series than the Taylor series, Taylor series starts at zero and goes up to infinity. The Lorenz series starts at a negative number, which is consistent with the pole and goes up. Okay. Or sorry, it's consistent with the power and goes up. Okay. okay. So we could expand this thing here. One minus this thing, right? And this would be the power that we expanded in. See? This is the A1 power. Okay. I know this is really obscure looking, but if you're if you're curious, it, it wouldn't take very long for you to, you know, just like we, we find the um coefficients for a Taylor expansion from the variable itself, that's exactly what we do. And you can kind of see the hints in there. There's an n factorial. <laughs> and on the top, you have the n minus 1, n minus 2, and the right, that type of thing. Okay, so what is the residual here? That's exactly right. Good. So now what is the value of this integral? <laughs> I don't know. Fuck you. <laughs> hold on, hold on. So let's say this slowly. So what's the first part? Two pi i times. Two pi i. Yeah, two pi i times. times that, right? angle, yeah. Minus five i all over 32. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then you look down 32a to the 7, right? Is that the residual according to this rule here? Okay. Um, except for there's one little problem here. Divide by 2. Divide by 2. So let's get rid of that. What? Wait, divide by 2? Yeah, why do I get to divide by 2? Are we oh, sure that 0 to infinity is like 0? Well, how would you know that? Look at functional part. Is that true? Well, uh, 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 this function does. This is what the theorem says, but that we only did half of it. Right. So, but is there any way to go with if you have a symmetric function? Is there any way to go from the full integral to a half integral over infinity? Yeah. Right. If it's symmetric on both sides, then each side has to contribute the same amount. So the integral from zero to infinity is equal. The integral from minus infinity to zero. It has to, right? Yeah. Okay. So this equals what? Five pi over thirty two. Very good. Simple, right? <laughs> Did that feel simpler or no? I mean, if you knew how to do the residues, yeah. Like, uh, if you know how to calculate residues, you see how powerful this is. Yeah. Okay, how do we get rid of the negative sign of the pi line? You tell me. Some of the factoring you're doing, I have to like spend five minutes. <laughs> That's only practice things perfect, right? This type of factoring, going from here to here, is just looking at the fact that you have this to the fourth, right? And being like, oh, let me just pull this guy out. And I'll put him at the bottom. And the reason I like that is because I prefer when I got one minus the whole thing. Just like before I had z, z to the fourth plus one. When you have z and another term with z, that's just horrifying. Just take terms and turn them into some power of z plus something else, right? OK. So to your point, did you figure out how this becomes positive? With the eyes? Yeah, exactly right. I, I, negative solution. Who means, right? Okay, so now I just taught you the rule. Let's break it. <laughs> oh, we're breaking, we're breaking it now? Breaking it. Okay, so um, 
This is a. Uh, this is great. You're gonna love this. Plus. Let's put a poll. Let's imagine a different um, integral, and don't think about this integral. So we're gonna still use this geometry, and okay, this geometry is perfectly fine. Um, in fact, we need to use this for any time we want to do that. But let's put a real pole here, or sorry, a pole in the real line. Now we're fucked, right? Now what do we do? It's on the real line. I don't know the whole yeah. point. You can't do that. I know. I know. Okay. I just told you I'm going to break the rule. Remember, this is why I put it in quotations. I said, this is a rule, but it's like kind of not a rule. And you'll see why. Oh, can you make it so that you can actually eliminate that pole in the first space? Like, you can make it uh, yeah, just move the origin. No, no, no. You can't move the origin. But you're very close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Let's just but, drive around. Like, if it's a point, okay. it's, it's really like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's the new. This is going to be some contour gamma, which is going to go to zero. <laughs> like, uh, right? It's a pole, right? It definitely has to go to zero. Yeah. And what is the value of the contour around the camp? R. Oh, actually. Oh, yeah. Oh. Interesting. Yeah, but I, yeah, that's correct. So in fact, um, it's a simple poll. Um, if you imagine the calculation goes as it did before, you would do the integral here, and then you would subtract off this one going in the opposite direction. See why that is? Yes. Because this one goes this way, and this one goes that way. So you subtract it off. And the contribution here, is minus i a minus one. That's the contribution of gamma. Mm -hmm. Did you say to yourself, well, why is it not two pi? Because it's a sensor. <laughs> it's, it's fun though, right? It's just an argument. Like, this is the best part of complex analysis. You're like, vibes feel right, I'm good. Does that make sense? I draw a cool drawing. I, there's a pole my way. I just drove around it. <laughs> you don't like it? Okay. You're like, no. <laughs> um, if you really feel like this is not rigorous enough, um, I encourage you, of course, to open up a math textbook where they prove all of these things in great detail. But as physicists, this is exactly my vibe. So you're just like, eh, feels uh, right. <laughs> okay. Um, what about... I hope we have enough time to do this. Um, this will probably end where, where we are for today. Um, we could do, we could do an example of this, but I think I want to show you a branch cut. Because you like branch cuts? You oh, love yeah. branch cuts? Yeah, yeah. So let's do some integrals of multi-value functions. So we talked briefly about um, multi-valued functions. Uh, what were some examples that we saw before? Functions of multi-valued functions. We're talking about, I mean, all our all complex things are all approaches from different things. No, we only had a couple examples. Yeah, square root of z was one. Z to the one half. Oh, you're okay. You're talking about the ones that are not analytic. Well, they can be analytic, but they they have multi values, right? So in order to make yeah, they're like logarithms. 
So in order to manage that, we did what? Um, it was the, the principal value that we declared. Exactly. So we declared the principal value and we required that we did something. Like having a branch cut at, and indicating that location. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. So let's uh, let's imagine here that you have some functions. Here's the integral. Zero to infinity. D x all over x one half times x plus a quantity cubed, where a is uh, larger. Do the same trick as the last time. Yeah, that's exactly what we're going to do, right? That's the whole point of learning tricks. Okay. So uh, let's do that here. Yeah, so we know that yeah. e to the power of one half is a multiple function. Um, <laughs> let's ask a couple questions first. Does z times f of z go to zero at large r? Or it um, yeah, it should. Okay. Um, so let me ask a couple of questions here. What kind of shape do we want to turn this integral from zero to infinity into? A contour. <laughs> Very good. Where would the contour be? Uh, do you want to do the same thing we did the real back lever line? So here's the problem, right? So you begin to think about this a little bit more, you'll see two problems. Where are the branch cuts? Uh, they're on the real lever. Yeah, they're X. On the X one, right? Yeah. Shit. So let's make a branch cut. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So we don't we don't want to integrate along that. that would oh, be silly. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, 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 buddy. Hey, buddy. Hey, <laughs> calm down. Okay. And where's the pole? What? At the origin shuttle, right? Okay. So, <laughs> yikers. <laughs> okay. And uh, that would be a shitty place to do all your contour integration. So let's do something insane. Okay, ready? Let's do a little circle here. And let's go out. Let's enclose the branch cut. And then, nope, let's not enclose the bell. <laughs> That's correct. It's Pokeball of complex analysis. So let's say I call this big circle gamma. And I call this little circle little gamma. Big circle, big gamma, little circle, little gamma. Now let's ask the question. Okay? No, you don't. Want to. <laughs> let's follow this around. Okay, which direction am I going? Are uh, you going counterclockwise? This one goes around. Yep. Okay. So I'm going up here. And this one goes in. And this one goes counterclockwise. And then this one goes out. Correct? I like it. <laughs> okay. We really don't have a lot of time. Um, so let's think about all of the different pieces. Let's name them perhaps so that it makes it clear. Um, let's call this uh, 
half one or half two. Okay. So the integral of half one plus oh, integral big gamma plus the integral of half two plus the integral of Okay. And that, and that's equal to the cost to that's equal to the pole inside of the contour. Now, is there a pole inside the contour yeah. or is it zero? At the apex. Good. All right. Um, and I can just give you that answer. Mm -hmm. Times the residual at the pole here, right? So the pole that's inside the contour is at minus a. Okay. Um, you could. So. Nothing. I'm saying Okay, and it's supported for you, of course, right? So we also have. Okay. Um, you can do the expansion like you did before. Find the residual, it'll be that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought we were continuing it. We're not. That's why we have a couple of parameters. Yeah, but why do we have an integral for it? What? Oh, no, no, this is path one and path two. Oh, yeah. this is the path from here to here, the path from here to here, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a little you're breaking up. I was gonna do one on a segment, but it's not you're really the, the whole contour in a segment. Yeah. So, um, what happens to <clears throat> now? This is a little tricky to think about. Um, as rho gets really small, rho being the size of a little gamma circle, what is the contribution? Okay, it goes to zero. Good contribution. So you just replace ones like as gamma with the gamma quantity. Z times F of Z also goes to Z. And I can have you show that afterwards if you care. Um, but essentially what, what we're showing here is that the contribution from the two circles, from big gamma and small gamma, are going to vanish as they go to their respective boundaries. That is to say, as little gamma heads towards the pole and as big gamma heads towards infinity. That makes sense? Yeah, I can see that. Okay. Um, and then you can take advantage of just the fact that you have these two paths that contribute here. So I said this has no contribution. This is no contribution. Right? And what you want is this. Right? So if I have this, which is both paths, one plus the other, I only want one of them, both are contributing half, right? Then I can just take half of this stuff. This. So, right? 
Cool. So that's the power of complex analysis. Hand waving, some fun, cut them up, throw them around, put the residuals in some and not in some. This residual sucks, I don't want to include it. This branch cut is complicated. I'm going to draw the branch cut so that I know not to accidentally integrate through it, right? Complex analysis, convert integrals require a deep understanding of what the poles are, where the branches are, and how to relate those to the rest of this. Okay. <laughs> Questions, comments, concerns? So that's it. That'll be complex analysis. And we'll do group theory on Monday and then on Wednesday. And then you have freedom. Do you want to try and do some Lorentz series on your own or just how valuable do you think that is? Well, we try it. Yeah. You can just throw one of those problems into the homework and um, yeah. you can just look at the formula for writing the first Lorentz term. Yeah. Cool. Okay. All right, then you won't feel as lost. Yeah, it'll give us a hands on. So for our like for our final, do we agree on the opinions or mm -hmm. in class or no, I mean just let me know. Okay. And then it'll be like during finals week or I hope so. Okay. I mean I can do them as soon as class ends, I guess, on Wednesday, but okay. not before then. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> I'd like to have all your input then. All right, understood. Cool. Definitely don't have to call <laughs>